This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Chad Hopkins, and joining me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Katie White. Katie, how are you doing? I'm well. It took us um, a half hour here to uh, get this going and to get um, <laughs> technical difficulties possibly worked out. There's still maybe some glitches, but let's just get this going. Yeah, I kind of wish I'd recorded all of that like separately so that we'd have like a bonus episode of just technical <laughs> difficulty figuring out troubleshooting. But here well, we are. We've made it. <laughs> we we have made it. And to start off with in our intro section, we've got emails from two different people, but they are both named Noah. So Noah and Noah, thank you very much for emailing us. The Noahs. I hear they come in pairs. Oh. Uh. Oh, <laughs> that was good. Thanks. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. all right. <laughs> um, our, well, with yeah. that, <laughs> go ahead and let's uh, talk about sex ed. What are our details on sex ed, Chad? Okay, so this is episode four of season seven. It aired on October fourteenth of two thousand ten. Was directed and written by our Toby Paul Lieberstein. Michael shows up to the office with a cold sore. Of course, everything is blown hugely out of proportion, and Michael ends up calling or visiting every single woman that he's been with since the beginning of the series to notify them of his quote-unquote disease. Of course, this leads to a deeper internal crisis for Michael. Meanwhile, Andy uses this opportunity to give a sex ed class with ulterior motives. Michael enters, trying to hide this, with a fake mustache. It doesn't last for very long. It slips off in his coffee, and he reveals to the world this fever blister and i don't want to ridicule it too much people get fever blisters it happens but i mean it is kind of gross looking (laughs) and everybody is quick to say oh by the way michael that is herpes and even though pam suggests to everybody hey maybe you should just go to a doctor and have a doctor like a person who's trained medically in diagnosing what these things actually are uh, go go see them and figure out what it is that way, officially, rather than listening to hearsay at the office. But they ignore her, and Michael starts freaking out, as Michael is wont to do. And Dwight, at this point, convinces him that it is the right thing to do to contact all the women he's been in contact with in uh, sexual relations with over his recent history. So for the show's purposes, six years. And that that's what kickstarts Michael's part of the story. And I think it's funny that, I mean, to my uneducated, unmedical, professional, whatever, um, herpes, the STD, and herpes, the, you know, cold sore, are kind of the same, like, they're they're in the same family, but they're not the same thing. Like, if you have a cold sore, you don't have an STD necessarily. <laughs> um, but Michael takes it as... I've got an STD. This is a sexually transmitted disease. And I have to tell all my ex-girlfriends because they now have an STD, which is not the case. Um, he does not have an STD, though he thinks he does. So Michael gets really defensive, specifically uh, when Dwight is mentioning that perhaps he got it from a woman, maybe Jan, maybe Holly. Michael gets really defensive over Holly. He says she was clean. If anything, I gave it to her. Um, So as you said, yeah, Michael tells, sorry, Dwight tells Michael that he needs to contact Holly specifically, tell her the bad news, um, that she is crawling with herpes. Um, In fact, crawling. Yeah. (laughs) Contact everyone. Um, So we get a huge, big episode full of um, voices and or faces of all, every one of his previous girlfriends. It goes way back. Yeah. Dates. I mean, not even girlfriends. So we start with Donna. We just get a phone call from her or with her. He starts by saying that he has a disease that has no known cure uh, that was sexually transmitted. And it's H, I, and you would think he would then say V, given, you know, (laughs) that people don't normally spell herpes and also incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, far more serious, too. Yeah, way more serious. But Donna does get upset with him. Oh, you you call me over getting herpes. Not a big deal. And she says, no, my, as Michael puts it, stupid husband does not have it either. So moving on to Holly. And what's great about when Michael calls Holly is they swing right back into things. It reminds me of back at the beginning of season three 
when Jim was at Stanford and Pam was still in Scranton and they happened upon each other on the phone that one evening Mm. and they talked for like two or three hours and they were just like stepping right back into their friendship. It's the same sort of thing that happens with Holly here where they're just stepping right back into where they left off basically with their stupid jokes and uh, quirks that they share uh, and Michael doesn't share with anybody else. He does forget to mention the herpes, but he asks, hey, Holly, what do you think would have happened? What do you think life would be like now if you hadn't been transferred? He says, I think we'd have twins. We would definitely be married. And Holly's response to that is, Michael, come on. We dated for a few weeks, and I've now been with AJ, who we met back in Lecture Circuit. Mm -hmm. She's been dating AJ for a year and a half. and so." Her relationship with AJ far eclipses her relationship with Michael in that amount of time. And for Michael to take away from this that they would have been married with kids at this point already, it's almost a little bit too much for her. And she says, you romanticize things. You blow things out of proportion. You remember things as bigger than they were. And Michael takes offense to this. He denies it. Dwight agrees with her. But Michael then turns it into his vendetta. It becomes less about the herpes for him the rest of the day as he surveys the women he's slept with in the past and more about, is this true about me? Do I over-romanticize things? Holly isn't sure what Michael is getting upset about. She says that they had a fun fling a long time ago, which is kind of, I mean, to Michael, who he's sure that he's supposed to marry this woman. It's upsetting to be talked about that way, that it was just a fling. But she says it was a good memory, um, and he cuts off the phone really quickly. He hangs up. Um, and as you said, he did not mention the herpes. Mm-hmm. Not the time to do that. Well, we also see, just a quick thing, we've seen how much his relationship with Holly changed Michael. Mm-hmm. Like, big, big, abounding changes in his life, and how he interacts with people, and how he interacts with women specifically. Yeah, he's still not perfect, but imagine, right before Holly, he was still dating Jan. Yeah. I mean, it's polar opposite. He goes from Jan to Holly and everything changes with the snap. And then after that, it's Helene. And even that's a pretty tame relationship, pretty normal relationship for Michael's standards. And yeah, there was that thing with Donna, but that's a separate issue. Michael has changed because of Holly and for her to make it so flippant and make it so inconsequential. I can understand for sure why Michael would be so upset about this. Mm -hmm. Especially given what Yeah, she means to him. Mm -hmm. Well, and then speaking of Jan, you mentioned she's the next one that we hear from. We actually see her. We go to the hospital where she now works. Um, And she appears to be very successful. I mean, she's doing the whole single mom power job thing. And she's very proud of that. She makes that very known. And Dwight begins this conversation, actually. He's kind of trying to push this through. And he um, states that there's an emergent matter that must be discussed immediately and then leaves. So Michael, instead of talking about what he's supposed to be talking about, the herpes, is still fixated on Holly and what she said. And he asks if he's the kind of person to misremember things, to misremember a relationship. So Jan takes the information he's given her and assumes that Michael is here for a post-mortem to see what killed their relationship. (laughs) So they have that talk, even though that's not why Michael's there and he does not want to do this. They are having their (laughs) post-mortem. I don't know if anybody actually calls it that. It sort of makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. But and she's in a hospital. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She's her official title is director of office purchasing at this hospital. They talk about things a little bit. Jam says no. In the the beginning, we were not good. Apparently, Michael thought you know we started off really strong, and Michael insinuates no, we were a good team. We we worked well together. Jam says what was exciting about us wasn't any dynamic that we necessarily had with each other, it was that it was wrong. And it wasn't because of their working relationship that it was wrong in her eyes. It was that she was the princess who had a crush on a guy who falls for a guy, as she says, beneath her station. The queen doesn't like it at all. And because the the princess knows the queen doesn't like it, she does it all the more to just to get at the queen. And so it, it's again, belittling Michael and his role in things where he didn't have any say so. And I mean, to be honest, I rewatched Dinner Party just in the last couple of days. And it's very clear, Michael did not have a lot of control in that relationship. But here, Michael is being told by multiple women in his life that he didn't have agency, or he didn't have 
it, it wasn't as much of a deal, as much of a relationship as he thought it was. It was very one-sided. And when Astrid, <laughs> Assy, <laughs> shows up <laughs> and Jan sings and it, it becomes very clear to Michael, this definitely isn't a woman that I was meant to be with. And I see that for sure now. It's almost like he had a little bit of doubt for a time maybe, uh, but this is very clear to him. Yeah, maybe this girl is cute, but this woman who's singing and doing all this weird, crazy stuff, she's not for me, and I'm glad that we're not together. And it tells so much about her psychology. I mean, we always knew that she saw herself as better than Michael, but Mm -hmm. that in her little scenario in her head, she is both a queen and a princess, and Michael is beneath the station, you know, of, of the princess. And that she's slumming it by being with Michael and, and she's going against orders and it's, it's like wrong and bad. And that's how she saw that whole relationship. And it's just, it makes total sense when you look back um, at like dinner party with that mentality of she was just kind of punishing herself by being with Michael. And it was just so unhealthy. From the hospital, they meet up with Helene asking about their relationship doing the same sort of thing do i blow things out of proportion do i misremember things and she says you know your memory fails you just by you thinking that you can try to have this conversation with me right now yes breaking up with helene and we had this conversation at the time breaking up with helene was the right thing for michael based on what he wanted out of life but the way he went about it was definitely not fair to her so for him to come up casually to helene and try and have a a civil conversation is really asking a little bit too much of her considering how he broke things off but she is agreeing in telling him this that yes you misremember things Obviously, you don't remember how you ended things with me because you treated me so poorly. And now here you are trying to uh, have us. I'm repeating myself. He eventually does mention the cold sore. Just she just kind of blows it off, says, hey, just don't touch it. As you said, she suggests that the memory that his memory has failed him in terms of their relationship. He calls her a jerk and leaves. And that's sort of it. That that visit was very brief. She really wanted nothing to do with him. The next one we see is Carol. So he shows up at an open house that she's holding. He calls her office and finds out where she's going to be. I guess it was important for him to see her rather than call her on the phone. I wonder why. But she asks why he's there. And and he first, again, he doesn't really care about the cold sore herpes at this time. He's just so focused on the uh, Holly questions. So first he asks if he romanticizes relationships. And she says that, well, everyone does that. And then he tells her that he has herpes and shows her his face. And then she takes back what she said. She says, Michael, you do make a bigger deal of things than than you need to. Uh, And she reminds him that he proposed to her on their fourth date. He's he romanticizes everything in his life, um, especially women. And even here with this cold sore herpes thing, like he's just exaggerating things to the nth degree. Which is why at the beginning of the episode, when Pam says, I like to catch a Michael train of thought, you know, before it (laughs) derails and kills an entire city or whatever, um, (laughs) catch it early because he says, is it cancer? No, 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 it's not cancer. Calm down. It's not cancer because he goes to the extremes, um, Mm -hmm. like proposing to a woman on the fourth date. Mm -hmm. Which I do. I want to point out, uh, Carol does refer to it as the fourth date, but back in Diwali. Uh, she referred to it as the ninth date. Okay. So little inconsistency. You could chalk that up to hyperbole, though. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's the first time we've seen Carol since end of season three. Mm-hmm. And it it is nice of her to sort of try and take it easy on him at first. I think she definitely agrees with all what the all, all the other women are saying, that he does blow things out of proportion. But she tries to say, you know, we all romanticize things. It's not a big deal. It happens to the best of us. But then when she's she realizes oh, you tracked me down because of that cold sore? Like, that's you. That's the reason? Okay, yeah, I agree with them. You are blowing things way out of proportion, Michael. You, you make a bigger deal out of things than anybody else does. So that ends his survey of all of these women. He returns to the office, and he makes one more phone call to Holly again. And he tries to do things amicably. He tries to say... I bumped into all these other women today that I used to date and they were fine. I had it in my mind that they were better than they actually were, but they weren't. And you were the only one who was excited to see me or to talk to me at all today. 
you were the only one to have any any contact. And then he ends it by saying, you're wrong. You're wrong. I remember every second of us. And I don't feel for them anything like what I feel for you. I didn't joke with them. I joked with you. You're the only one who was actually happy to hear from me. And I don't know why you downgraded what we had, but I did not make us up. So I love seeing Michael standing so strong with what he thinks happened, what he believes happened. Thinks is almost too light a word. He believes what I had with Holly was real. And he he is. He's telling her, not to her face, but telling her straight up, I'm taking offense to what you're saying. I don't know why you're downgrading what we had, because what we had was special. And uh, we know just at the end of season six that maybe there's a future bump in happening soon because Joe promised Michael that she'd try and do something about bringing Holly back to Scranton. And so that's definitely what it seems like we're leading up to. It's the most sober we've heard Michael definitely in this episode, but in several episodes, this is the most soberly we've heard him speak. He's very sure of this. His, his interactions with the women that he's had on this day clarified any thought, you know, like it was just, I don't know how to put it, but it, it was a very uh, sobering day for him to kind of realize his feelings that he had for Holly and that he did get a little bit upset with her saying like, no, I, I, I know what I felt. I wish you wouldn't try to make that not true for me because that was true for me. I love seeing Michael being competent, being strongly convicted, being honest. We see lighter versions of that, like at the end of business school, which I also rewatched recently <laughs> when he goes to Pam's art show or uh, what's another instance where well, really in that same episode when he, he talks to Ryan and he says, you know, Ryan managers don't fire people. They hire people and they inspire people. And that's even in his anger. He, he's being straight up with Ryan. I'm in this for the people. Business is the most personal thing in the world. And here, we're not talking about Michael's business acumen or his business tactics or anything like that. We're talking about his personal relationship, straight up, full-fledged. But he has that same approach where Michael almost approaches every relationship in his life like it's the most important one, which I think is a really special quality he has. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So moving on uh, to the, the B plot of this episode, there's not a whole lot to say. But it, it starts with Meredith. Meredith is the one who tells Michael at the beginning of, of the episode, you know, Michael, I, I know lots of people with herpes. And you know what? I have herpes. And that grosses out a lot of people in the office. They start avoiding her. Angela starts holding her breath around Meredith until she gets out of her immediate vicinity, which is hugely offensive. STDs are not passed through the air, so you don't have to worry about it. But Andy steps up and stands up for her. And we learn a little bit more about Andy. He was an RA in college. And so as an RA in college, at some point in his life, he feels the need to treat everybody like his students and have almost in a way the, the talk with everybody. <laughs> yeah, I kind of forgot the end of this episode for him. And so when I was taking notes on this, I put, for whatever reason, he's really struck up an interest in sexual health and how the office is treating certain people, namely Meredith. Uh, and as we got towards the end, I was like, oh, right. Okay, but we'll get to that. When he first wants to talk about this, no one wants to listen. So he brings in pizza as an incentive so they can have some if they attend his sex ed discussion. Of course, his version of a sex ed class involves showing people printed <laughs> photos of genitalia while they're eating and then pictures of diseased genitalia while they're eating. Not a lot of fun, I could imagine. And he goes on during the day and just he tries to make this pro and con list, which is pretty funny. I'm sure we'll get into that uh, in the funny moments. But oops, there's a motive behind all of this sex ed stuff. Uh, and it has surfaced. He reminds everyone that the only safe sex practice is abstinence. Now that he's mentioned it, is anybody by chance practicing abstinence? Oh, uh, this would be a good time to remember that Aaron and Gabe are dating and they are in the room and they do not raise their hands. Mm hmm. It it's a lot of effort <laughs> for a simple answer. Yeah. It's admirable almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> but the thing about his talk, it does seem at first that he's earnest and that he's honest about his intentions here. He he cares about students. He he says the number one sexually transmitted disease is ignorance, which is 
PS, but whatever. <laughs> and he, he does seem passionate about it. And he seems upset when people start derailing his talk about this. Uh, his pro con list did not start off as a pro con list. It was all about to supposed to be about the risks of having sex. But then everybody else starts pointing out the positive sides. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to funny moments. But there is some good in this. Aaron is paying very close attention. She's very interested in what Andy has to say, or at least not maybe not in what he has to say, but in him showing confidence in front of others, in him having the attention of others. It's like she wants him to be successful in what he's trying to accomplish. I don't think she necessarily cares what he's trying to say, if that makes sense, yeah. that distinction. Like when the um, talk goes off rail, she tries to kind of guide the rest mm-hmm. of the office back on discussion she's trying to help him out in his lesson basically right as everybody else is pointing out the positives of sex she says andy but isn't there a lot of negatives or a lot of a lot of risks with sex as well and he's like yes 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 and tries to get back onto things uh so it's nice to see that aaron is still somewhat on andy's side even if she is dating gabe so when Aaron and Gabe don't raise their hands, he loses it. Andy loses it. He slams pizza against the wall, uh, storms out. It looks like pre-anger management Andy is back, at least for this moment. And then Gabe and Andy sit down and talk. Gabe suggests that this wasn't really about Meredith, was it? And he reminds Andy that he and Aaron were broken up when Gabe pursued Aaron. Gabe even asked Andy's permission to ask Aaron out, and Andy gave permission. So now Andy's reneging and saying that the only reason he did give permission was because Gabe asked so politely and he felt like he had to say yes. Well, that's not how that works. You got to be strong and, you know, give your actual opinions when somebody asks you about something. So got to side with Gabe here, unfortunately. Yeah. Though I like Andy and Aaron together. Yeah. I mean, we've seen and talked about many times how Andy's just not, uh, to put it, A certain way, uh, and I don't mean any offense here, he's not being the man. Right. Like, he's not being a man about it. You know what I mean? He's not holding firm, not pursuing what he wants actively. He's being so passive in this relationship. Of course, Gabe is going to take her away, especially if he just tells him to take her away. It doesn't get any more clear cut than that, Andy. He's Mr. Manners, and he can't break that. So, have her, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get into funny stuff. I I like this cold open mostly because it introduces another favorite side character. Yes. Nate. Do you want to do it? Uh, Sure. So Dwight is searching for day laborers. He's looking, it looks like, through a a Hispanic community. But none of them want to come with him. And we get this hilarious talking head. (laughs) It's not like trying to be hilarious it just comes across as hilarious the way they do it it's almost like something out of breaking bad or something yeah. where the, this this like grizzled man is speaking in spanish and he has his young fresh-faced son translating for him he says we do not go with that man i've seen many men go with that man and they never come back <laughs> and dwight then explains exactly what's been happening he hires these day laborers Tells them they'll get paid at 6, but at 5.45, Mose pretends to be an INS agent, picks him up, drops him off in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and tells them that it's Canada. <laughs> so he's getting free work for a day in order to maintain the building that he now owns, but he's not being honest about it. So then um, Dwight finds a laborer, finds a man um, who is clearly a white English-speaking man. <laughs> walks up to Dwight's car. They have a conversation in very broken Spanish. Neither man speaks Spanish very well. Dwight learns that this man is from Philadelphia, then Scranton. He speaks good English, which is convenient because so does Dwight. (laughs) They're both native, very white, non-Spanish speaking people. And Dwight hires him to take care of the hornet's nest in the parking lot at Dunder Mifflin. Dwight has provided him all the tools he'll need, he says. Um, Notable Weapons are a bow and arrow, a bat, and a blowtorch. So very confusing. Um, (laughs) Dwight says it's a do or die situation. He'll either do it or he'll die. Nate opts for the bat. (laughs) Of all the options. (laughs) And it it does not go well. He he swings at it. He knocks it down. But he also gets stung very many times. 
And that's the last we see from Nate this episode. But rest assured, everybody, we learn more about Nate. We see lots more of him. And it is wonderful. Yeah. In the break room at lunch, everyone's talking about how gross Meredith is. And Kelly wonders who Meredith will ever marry. Maybe a meth dealer with crabs. (laughs) And then, as you mentioned, uh, Meredith comes in and sits at Angela's table. And Angela gathers her belongings so quickly. And we see her run out and then uh, exhale all of her breath because she's been holding her breath. So awful. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> when when Michael's fake mustache first falls off and Phyllis is the first one to notice the the cold sore and point it out to everybody, he says, It's a pimple, Phyllis. Avril Levine gets them all the time and she rocks harder than anyone alive. <laughs> I want to remind everybody this was 2011. <laughs> and I think Avril Levine had already long fallen out of public consciousness at this point. Yeah. But not Michael consciousness. He probably just discovered Skater Boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to go listen to that song again. <laughs> Regarding Michael romanticizing things, this is one of my favorite lines from the episode, which to me was a not super funny episode because there was so much, you know, mm-hmm. meat to it. Holly says, Michael, you romanticize everything. You cried at that tagline for a movie that you made up. <laughs> Michael then gives us the tagline. He had no arms or legs. He couldn't hear, see, or speak. This is how he led a nation. <laughs> That's so wonderful. I want to watch that movie. <laughs> uh, that that should be his next project after Threat Level Midnight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when he first leaves Jan, he has a talking head. He says, I used to think that she was the one, or at least a the one. And if I call that one so wrong, uh, there, there's not, you can't have multiple the ones. The is singular, Michael. Singular. <laughs> I also liked in his comparison with with himself and Jan, he said, there was a bit of a learning curve in the conversation department, but between the sheets, we were like Jordan and Pippen, who, of course, were (laughs) famous basketball players, are famous basketball players, uh, with great game chemistry, playing chemistry, but, you know, probably didn't have sex. So maybe not the best analogy, but I just I just made me laugh that he compared them to two basketball players. It just seemed a little aggressive. When he approaches Helene at the park, he approaches an older woman, like a much older woman than Helene, sitting on a bench and starts trying to have a conversation with her like she's actually Helene. It's like he's, again, this is sort of proving the point. He over romanticizes things. He blows things out of proportion. And the reason he broke up with Helene was because she was old in his eyes. And so it's just a, just like Michael for him to show up and to automatically assume that she's this much older woman sitting on the bench rather than the, the much less old appearing, <laughs> that was very poor English, but you know what I mean, woman sitting just behind him. And I like how any confusion on the old lady's part was probably, you know, Helene's dementia that she apparently has because she's old. <laughs> it's, like, it's okay. We dated. <laughs> no, we didn't. Oh. Yep. During Andy's sex ed class, we mentioned this pro and con list. He begins a list of what was supposed to be negative consequences of sex. Everyone starts listing the good things about it. It feels unbelievable. It feels amazing. Both of him were Kevin. <laughs> Aaron's got his back. She reminds him that there are negatives to sex, like unplanned pregnancy. Kelly jokes that Jim and Pam's baby was a mistake. Pam defends that CC was not a mistake. She was a surprise. <laughs> um, and Daryl defends them. He says... They don't regret having that child. Therefore, unplanned pregnancy should be moved to the pros column. So, so far, <laughs> apparently there are no negatives to having sex. <laughs> well, just know. STDs. J- just STDs. That's true. But because of Creed, it, the, the risk of STDs is gone because the, the, the feeling of pure risk is, a, is a, apparently thrilling. a pro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, when he first tries to get everybody's attention, this is before he gets the pizza. He says, excuse me, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? And Stanley's response is, oh, not again. (laughs) And Andy says, what do you mean again? And so they start saying, you're always asking for attention. And he says, well, maybe a year ago. Stanley says, seems recent. And then Oscar speaks up and says, Andy, the reason it seems more recent is because many of us here have never stood up and asked for everyone's attention. And it seems like you've done it on several occasions. <laughs> and Andy starts having a conversation. And then Phyllis speaks up, interrupting and says, oh, it was when you got your new phone. That's when you asked for everyone's attention. So everybody's <laughs> hung up on the last time Andy interrupted everybody to ask for their attention. And uh, 
Stanley says, oh, yeah, you, you, you kept announcing scores because he got his new phone. And Andy said, it's the world's only international sport. <laughs> and he just sits down. He's frustrated. He's had enough. <laughs> Another Andy one. Um, he comes into Daryl's office after the sex ed stuff, really frustrated. Uh, Daryl says, are you crying? Andy says, no, I'm just sweating. And then Daryl gives some really sage advice here. He says, I don't know what's got you upset, but my advice is to stop crying. (laughs) Good to know. Just stop crying. (laughs) Very good advice. The last Andy moment for me is he he feels the need to demonstrate putting on a condom to everybody because apparently this is middle school. And he tries to put one on a pencil. (laughs) And Stanley just cackles. And Oscar says, Andy, why a pencil? He says, well, obviously I can't use my own penis. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Please do not. But, I mean, there's there's something that people normally use when demonstrating such a thing, and it's definitely not a pencil. Yeah. Maybe my last one. Michael finally ends his day of talking to past lovers by talking to Oscar. Because, you know, of course, they were <laughs> totally lovers. They once, quote unquote, <laughs> sucked face. Oscar for his sexually transmitted <laughs> disease. That one time that he pecked Oscar uh, in the conference room. So Dwight demands a list of every person Oscar has ever slept with. They give a long list of examples where he might have hooked up with someone. Favorites include train stations, men's restrooms, flower shops, firework celebrations, moonlit gondolas, a carriage ride through Central Park, Democratic primary or something like that. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Anywhere where there are people. (laughs) Yeah, basically. Also a lot of gay stereotypes in that, too. Yeah. Also in that conversation, when Michael says, you may have given me a sexually transmitted disease, he says, herpes duplex. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what it's called. It's herpes simplex. (laughs) It is definitely not a house made for two families. (laughs) Uh, I got got just a couple more quick ones. When they visit Carol, as you said, they visit her at a house showing. And Dwight comes from upstairs and he says, someone died in the upstairs bathroom, didn't they? (laughs) There's no context for that. There's no explanation as to why he would think that. But Carol just says, no. (laughs) Uh, I I just love, there's someone died in the (laughs) upstairs bathroom, didn't they? (laughs) And then lastly for me, it comes from at the very beginning of the episode, Kevin says to Meredith, who's just announced that she has herpes, he says, I've never seen herpes on you. And Meredith says, because it's on my genitals, genius. Kevin says, you have a penis? (laughs) That's not what genitals means. It is not inclusive to the word penis. I did know someone as a kid who thought that was the case. (laughs) And I had to break it. And it was like, (laughs) okay. Oh, deleted scenes. So. I quite liked this one. I didn't know where it was going. It was actually a series of deleted scenes. We saw um, several very uncomfortably tense scenes with with Jim and Pam. They walk in in silence and don't, we don't really know what's up. They don't talk. I don't know. And then Toby notices that something's up. They're acting very cold towards each other. They won't sit by each other as we see in the main episode in, in Andy's sex ed. We never learn what's up, why they're upset. But in the last deleted scene... We see them walking towards their car, again, in silence, and Jim just slaps her on the butt, like in a playful, you know, ma- manner. She stops and looks at him and then breaks and laughs, and uh, the tension's broken and they're okay. And we don't know what was up, but it was such a well-done, like, arc that they totally mm-hmm. took out of the episode, and you didn't need to know what was up, just married people problems, and it got resolved just by a, a little spat, like a little playful thing. So it was just really, I like that. I was really confused at first because the very first, it's the very first deleted scene we get where they walk into the office and they just like hang up their coats and have a seat. I was like, what was the point of that? Because there's not necessarily tension there because you're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, okay, why why did they cut out just them walking into the office? Like, why does it matter? Why is that even included? Right. (laughs) But uh, it's a good payoff. Jim goes into the kitchen and. Kelly is having difficulty opening a jar of marshmallow fluff because she wants a, a fluffer nutter, I guess. And yeah, it's a hard to open jar. He can't even open it. He's really struggling. And while he's sitting there struggling, Kelly takes the opportunity to ask about her personal life. She says, you know, Ryan, right? <laughs> and then talks about how uh, she thinks that Ryan loves her, but she also thinks he's incapable of true love. 
And he said that if he was in heaven and she was in hell, he wouldn't give up his spot in heaven to go live with her. And I didn't even ask him about that. Why would he even mention that? And and it, it goes on. But then Jim eventually just says, here, and gives it, gives the jar back unopened. Like, I'm done with this. <laughs> Can't do this and you're driving nuts. <laughs> and the whole time, Pam is sitting at the, the kitchen table and she's just sort of laughing in the background. It's pretty funny. I also did like the deleted scene. Um, we get Dwight and Michael calling the Winnipeg Sheridan. <laughs> they asked to, to be sent to the concierge, her phone. Guess who is the concierge at Winnipeg? Uh, Sheridan. It's concierge mm-hmm. Marie, our favorite. Yes. So while they're on hold, Dwight wonders if this is really Michael's full list of women in six years. He said that he had more sex in high school. Michael, uh, yeah. Michael rebuts that he was too busy maintaining a B average and appearing in plays um, to have a bunch of sex in high school. Uh, same. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> lots of plays. Um, <laughs> when, when Michael answers the phone, um, oh, sorry, when Marie answers the phone, she says, how may I help you? And Michael just says, by going to the doctor and getting tested for herpes and hangs up. And that's the scene. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. Um, Dwight has a talking head and he says, Holly brings out a sense of childlike wonder in Michael. And he doesn't like it because a childlike wonder leads to a childlike grave. <laughs> like curiosity killed the cat situation. Yeah, basically. Oh, I also forgot to mention in that scene I just mentioned, Dwight and Michael make plans to gather all of Michael's exes together, maybe for the holidays. He thought it'd be fun to see Mm. them all at once. Mm -hmm. Dwight was much more gross about it than you just were. He says, imagine all these women that your penis has touched. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, thanks. Brian complains about Andy's choice of pizza in a cut scene. He says, five pizzas and not one of them plain. <laughs> Andy gets a little snarky with him. He says, sorry, when the guy asked for toppings, I forgot to ask for nothing. Fair. Come on, Ryan. <laughs> you can't eat pepperoni. Plus, like, categorically, I think plain pizza is just more boring, but I could be, I don't know, I could be I mean, ousted for that statement. If there's plain cheese pizza, I'll eat it. Like, sure. if there's pizza, I'll eat it. <laughs> if, it's, <laughs> but- if it's plain pizza or no pizza... Like I pick yeah. on pizza. My yeah, but if I have the option, I'm going to put lots of meat toppings on there. Yeah, I'm an American. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Michael and Dwight are uh, on the swing at the park, or rather, Dwight's pushing Michael on the swing at the park. And Michael says he's starting to get the feeling that all of these women being negative uh, has something to do with him. You know, it's very possible since... <laughs> I think he's on to something. I think he's figured it out. <laughs> By George, he's got it. <laughs> Andy has a talking head. He says, I'm the only one here with experience teaching kids about STDs, Ivy League kids. And he says, do I have to do everything around here? And he says, well, not everything. And my response to that is, no, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do some things, Andy. Yeah. Oh, I believe the last one, at least for me anyway, Dwight agrees that maybe Michael did read too much into these relationships. And just as well, too, because he wants to hook Michael up with his cousin, Shirley. Michael says, okay, enough with Shirley. You mentioned her a million times. I'm not interested. Dwight says, okay, okay, but you know what? Holly's been holding you back. If you really put your mind to it, you could date a newscaster. We get to Dwight's talking head. (laughs) Turns out Shirley's a newscaster. (laughs) He is set on it. Well played. Well played. We're skipping on the discussion topic this week because we've already had some good discussion and we also don't want to dive too far into things as two people who know what is coming up and that's as simple as we'll put it yeah so that is the end of the official 70th episode of an american workplace contact for the show facebook.com slash workplace pod and at workplace pod on twitter please continue to go over to apple Podcasts if you haven't already rate us review us and subscribe hit that little button that helps us out in a big way and we really appreciate it if you have any feedback or ideas or just want to say hi you're welcome to email us as well, workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place for me, as always, is on Twitter at chadadada, that is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also, facebook.com slash chad.hopkins. And you can also listen to my other podcast, Cinescope. And you can find that where other podcasts can be found or at thecinescopepodcast.com. Show notes and all contact information can be found at workplacepodcast.com.
We do have a new Patreon subscriber, Brittany. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, we hope to hear from you personally soon. And if you want a shout out, uh, as in other yous out there who have not subscribed to us on Patreon, and if you want more of an American Workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline and notes that we make every week, a logo sticker, bonus episodes, live streams of every recording of the main show, at least, go over to our Patreon page, pick the support level that you think is worth it to you. You can find that at patreon.com slash workplace pod. And that is all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 70 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 71 for our discussion on the next two episodes of season seven, The Sting and Costume Contest. Bye. Bye. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash workplace. Nope. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you're not wrong. I can't hear you, but that was great.